Bien. Et c'est un honneur, un plaisir général et un plaisir personnel et particulier d'accueillir euh, Jane Mansbridge euh, aujourd'hui ici. Je n'entrerai pas dans toutes les raisons euh, pour lesquelles c'est un très grand plaisir, mais son, sa, présentation, euh, sa présentation importe. Euh, Jenny Mansbridge est euh, Adams Professor euh, à la Kennedy School of Government à Harvard. Elle est l'auteur d'un premier livre important, très important, qui a marqué euh, une génération et certainement euh, moi de, euh, de political theorists, qui était son « Beyond Adversary Democracy ». Ce, ce travail euh, qui a été publié au début des années 80, peut-être même à la, fin des années 79, à la fin des années 70, marqué au moins pour des, euh, pour des Français, pour un Français, la possibilité de combiner une enquête empirique et une enquête de terrain de la démocratie de face à face des town meetings de Nouvelle-Angleterre avec une réflexion philosophique et même une réflexion de philosophie normative. C'est aussi comme cela qu'il a, euh, qu a été perçu, mais ça a été une contribution marquante et importante. Elle a ensuite publié un, un ouvrage également important sur le, le passage, ou plus exactement la défaite de l'Equal Rights Amendment euh, aux États-Unis, combinant là aussi une étude de terrain, une perspective euh, normative, et ce, euh, ce volume a été aussi... Euh, peut-être plus proche du militantisme dans, le, dans son objet d'étude, a été aussi un important développement. Par ailleurs, elle a édité une multitude de volumes sur le, la place de l'intérêt égoïste, sur le féminisme, sur l'opposition. Et dans une toute dernière période, euh, Jenny a repris ses investigations sur la représentation en entreprenant de la repensée et de fournir de nouvelles idées. Peut-être que la représentation, c'est comme la délibération. C'est un sujet dont on n'a jamais épuisé le potentiel, propulse, le potentiel producteur. Encore faut-il des grands producteurs pour le, euh, pour le tirer. Et, euh, et enfin, euh, je pense qu'on peut annoncer dans cette, euh, dans cette enceinte que euh, Jenny vient de recevoir le prix Madison, qui est une des plus hautes distinctions accordées par l'American Political Science Association, tous les trois ans, pour une contribution exceptionnelle à la science politique euh, américaine et, en, et à la vérité mondiale. Et donc, le plaisir, c'est de l'avoir à Paris, euh, d'avoir une, euh, une grande dame de la science politique euh, euh, américaine à Paris. Et le plaisir personnel, c'est que, voilà, 25 ans, ou presque 30, que nous discutons de délibération. Jenny, welcome. Thank you very much. What a lovely introduction, thank you. <clears throat> I want to begin by thanking the organizers of the conference for inviting me and for putting together this exciting event. Um, since I brought forth the idea of a deliberative system um, a decade or so ago in an article on everyday talk, um, many theorists have taken up the concept Uh, and today my lecture will draw on a project in deliberative co-authorship uh, with several authors of essays in a volume that John Parkinson and I are putting out that Cambridge will publish uh, called The Deliberative System. So this is my second attempt at deliberative co-authorship. Uh, unlike the first, which was trying to um, sort of put the screws on a, um, a, a concept that had already been processed quite a bit. This is more of an opening of discussion. It's at an earlier stage than a fully worked out article. And in this lecture, I will expand on that article in two ways. Uh, first, to stress even more heavily than the article does the concept of societal decisions, and then to um, bring out the concept of an emergent social decision, and I hope I'll present a slightly amusing diagram of, of, of such, such a possible system. As for the rest, it's not possible to sort out my thought from that of my co-authors, one of whom, Mark Warren, is uh, here in the conference, and I would like to give due credit to them all. 
Um, let's see, how do I go forward? So I want to briefly begin by canvassing the reasons for a systemic approach to democ democratic deliberation, explain what I mean by system, and I will uh, explain, uh, suggest three functions that a system of democratic deliberation ought to fill, the epistemic or truth-seeking function, the ethical, equal respect, assuring equal respect, and the democratic, the egalitarian and inclusive. And then I'll discuss the difference between state decisions, which are binding, create political obligation, and uh, use the state's monopoly, legitimate monopoly of force, and societal decisions, which are both formal and emergent. And then I'll use a few examples to illustrate the, what I hope to illustrate the virtues of the systemic approach, and then touch briefly on five pathologies that might arise. So let me start with the reasons. There's recently been a growing consensus among deliberative theorists that we need to focus not only on individual sites and processes, um, but also on the interdependence of the sites and processes in a deliberative system. Because no single form, however ideally constituted, can possess enough deliberative capacity to elicit all the information and insights and induce sufficient public reflection and contest necessary for sound governmental and social decisions or for legitimate democratic decisions. So thinking um, in terms of a system offers several advantages. First, a systemic approach allows us to think about deliberative democracy in large scale terms. The problem of scale has been a continual challenge for deliberative theory. Face-to-face -face deliberation happens only in a small group. Parliamentary deliberation is confined only to those forms organized by states or subnational units. So a systemic approach allows us to think productively and creatively about ways that whole societies, demoi, peoples, or even different communities can deliberate together. It allows us to think about deliberations that develop among and between different sites over time. Now, this systemic approach does not require that we take a nation or a large polity as our object of study. We could use, look at deliberative systems within schools, within universities, within hospitals, within the media. But this approach does allow us to think about relatively democratic decisions, both binding and otherwise, being taken in a variety of deliberative venues and institutions interacting together in a deliberative system. And second, a deliberative approach allows us to analyze the division of labor among parts of a deliberative system, each with its different strengths and weaknesses, and to conclude that a single part, which itself may have low or even negative deliberative quality, may nevertheless make an important contribution to an overall deliberative system. Elite and expert deliberation, for example, may be non-inclusive, is non-inclusive, but it's often epistemically productive. It produces knowledge that we could not get otherwise. Highly partisan rhetoric, to take another example, may violate deliberative ideals of mutual respect and accommodation, but it may promote inclusion and it may epistemically sharpen the broader public deliberation. So a systemic approach suggests looking for deliberative ecologies in which different contexts facilitate um, some forms of deliberation, some avenues for information, while others facilitate different forms and avenues. And third, a systemic approach encourages us, encourages us to investigate other forms of interaction and interdependence. For example, the possibility of displacement, in which a deliberative advance in one part of the system creates a deliberative retreat in another place. And finally, a systemic approach may introduce into the analysis broad systemic inadequacies that have an impact on individual sites and shape the possibilities of individual deliberation. So what do I mean by a system? This is a loose definition. A system involves both differentiation and integration among the parts. It requires a set of distinguishable 
and differentiated, but to some degree interdependent parts, often with distributed functions and some division of labor, connected in a way to form a complex whole. It requires a functional division of labor so that some parts do work that others cannot do as well, and it requires some relational interdependence so that a change in one component will bring about a change in some others. A, del a deliberative system is one that encompasses the talk-based approaches to political conflict and problem solving, arguing, talking, demonstrating, uh, expressing, persuading. Now this notion of a system does not require, um, it's not intended to be mechanistic, it's probabilistic rather than determinative. It doesn't require that every component have a function or that every component be interdependent with every other, uh, such that a change in one will automatically bring about a change in others, in all others, or in the entire system. It is not necessarily that any one function be fulfilled optimally in any location, since in a deliberative system, the same function may be distributed across various subsystems. And it, the system does not have to have clearly identifiable boundaries. Now normatively, in the systemic approach, the entire burden of decision making and legitimacy does not fall on one form or institution, but is distributed among the different components on different issues. One or more parts may fall short on or even violate entirely one or more deliberative standards, but in conjunction with other parts, improve the deliberative quality of the system. So we expect that a highly functional deliberative system will be redundant or potentially redundant in interaction so that when one part fails to play an important role, another can fill in or evolve over time to fill in. A highly functional system will include checks and balances of various forms so that excesses in one part are checked by the activation of other parts of the system. We envision systems that are dynamic rather than static, so it may be hard to predict in advance when or why some parts of the system will respond to certain forms of public opinion or represent certain interests or publics or certain kinds of values and procedures. What do I mean by highly functional? And here Jan may I welcome Jan's jumping on me on this one, um, because this is uh, definitely a work in progress. Um, so we can ac ac uh, access institutions according to how well they perform uh, some functions necessary to produce, uh, promote the goals of the system. Now theorists disagree, as you know, about the uh, goals of deliberation within a democracy, and so there is probably going to be strong disagreement about the most important functions of a deliberative system. However, we believe that a larger deliberative approach can accommodate a variety of functions and goals, and its value does not uh, depend on resolving those disagreements. For our purposes, three functions that are relatively non-controversial in their most general articulation serve to illustrate how a systemic approach can be applied. And we identify epistemic, ethical, and inclusive egalitarian functions. The epistemic function of a deliberative system is to produce preferences, opinions, and decisions that are appropriately informed by facts and logic and perspectives, and that are the outcome of substantive and meaningful consideration of relevant reasons. Now by reasons, as Bernard has explained already, I don't mean a kind of classic 18th century or even Habermasian reason. I mean considerations of various sorts. A healthy deliberative system is one in which relevant considerations are aired, discussed, and appropriately weighed. The locations in which this weighing occurs may not act publicly although the absence of any publicity at all would limit deliberative capacity. Because the topics of these uh, deliberations are issues of common concern, epistemically well-grounded preferences, opinions, and decisions must be informed by and take into consideration the preferences and opinions of other citizens, fellow citizens. So in addition to the epistemic reasons for listening to what others have to say, 
there are also ethical reasons. A primary ethical function of the system is to promote mutual respect among citizens. Prudentially, mutual respect he helps keep the deliberative system running. Uh, it serves as the lubricant of effective communication. Um, I was just talking with Mark last night about why Joe Cropsey, a Straussian conservative professor on meeting me for the first time many, many years ago said, please call me Joe. And I think one of the reasons, there were many reasons, but I think one was to produce the equality and mutual respect, or, or to introduce, not to produce it, but to begin a track toward mutual respect that would then facilitate good communication, good deliberation among colleagues in our department. Um, so mutual respect serves as a lubricant to deliberation and communication, prudentially, just as an, a sociological fact. Ethically, mutual respect among human beings is a good in itself. Mutual respect is also an ethical requirement among democratic citizens. The moral basis for mutual respect in democracy is grounded in the idea that citizens should be treated, in Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson's words, not merely as objects of legislation, as passive subjects to be ruled, but as autonomous agents who take part in the governance of their society directly or through their representatives. So the moral basis is built into the idea of democracy. And that's not controversial. Although how mutual respect should be interpreted in practice may be. <laughs> Theorists and citizens alike disagree as to what mutual respect means, what constitutes its successful achievement, and how weighty it is compared with other considerations. But we stress it because even more than other consider ethical considerations, it's intrinsically a part of deliberation. To deliberate with another and to be open to being moved by the other's arguments is to understand and respect the other as a self-authoring source of reasons, claims, and perspectives. And other goods are closely linked with mutual respect. It applies, for example, to non-domination because relationships of domination have already short-circuited mutual respect and with this deliberative influence. Now, a final function of deliberation, not completely separable from the first two, is to promote an inclusive political process on terms of equality. This inclusion of multiple and plural voices, interests, concerns, and claims on the basis of feasible equality is not simply an ethic added to democratic deliberation. It's the central element of what makes deliberation democratic. Who gets to be at the table affects the scope and content of deliberation, and for those excluded, no deliberative democratic legitimacy is generated. So a well-functioning de deliberative democratic system must not systematically exclude any citizens from the process without strong justification that could be reasonably accepted by all citizens, including the excluded. On the positive side, a well-functioning deliberative system ought actively to promote and facilitate inclusion and the equal opportunities to participate in the system. So the successful realization of the, all three of these functions promotes the legitimacy of democratic decision-making by ensuring that reasonably sound decisions, epistemic, in the context of mutual respect among citizens and an inclusive process of collective choice. Legitimacy in this strong sense maximizes the chances that people who share a common fate, and that will be our boundary, will agree willingly to the terms of their common cooperation. Now, obviously, these functions are going to come in conflict within any deliberative system, and there'll be controversy over their relative weights. Um, and some deliberative Democrats will assign, for example, much higher priority to mutual respect I myself assign a very high priority to mutual respect, then to the aim of producing epistemically sound decisions. Many conflicts will have to be worked out through deliberation on a provisional basis in any context. But a systemic approach, I think, allows for a nuanced application of these functions, recognizing that some will be more important than others in different parts of the system. Now, an epistemic approach also complicates the question of standards. Because what might be considered low quality deliberation in some circumstances 
uh, would, from a system, or even undemocratic deliberation, would, from a systems perspective, can contribute to an overall high quality deliberation or an overall democratic deliberation. So that not, every, for example, not every group, not every voluntary association that participates in the larger deliberative system need be internally fully democratic. Indeed, the purposes of institutions and their functions in collective decisions will dictate differing constraints on decisions, such as instructions to juries about the rules of evidence. Um, you will, you restrain communication, you constrain uh, information in order in that particular context to produce a better deliberation. Blind peer review in journals is another example of reducing information to enhance deliberation. So judging one, the quality of the whole system on the basis of the functions and goals uh, one specifies for the system does not require that the, these functions be fully realized in all the parts. So we're arguing, in short, for a two-tier approach to evaluation, specific forum and larger system. So before I go to the examples, I want to touch briefly on the relation between state and society. Now, as you know, previous ex uh, uh, attempts to conceptualize a deliberative system have centered on the state. Jürgen Habermas used the spatial metaphor of center, periphery, the center being the place of binding decisions, will formation, and the periphery being the place of less formal deliberation, opinion formation. Such a deliberation, such a deliberative system takes the modern nation state as its subject and makes the legislature its center. Now in many contexts, it's quite important to preserve that distinction between state and societal distinctions. State decisions are binding on all members of the polity. They produce political obligation. And those decisions are implemented through the state's legitimate monopoly of violence. And that makes them subject to legitimacy criteria. Though because of the importance of law as implemented by the state's legitimate monopoly of violence, Previous maps of the deliberative system have all centered on the state. So just to take one example um, from an article in 2006, Carolyn Hendricks, along with many others, depicted, here you have political parties, interest groups, social movements, networks, individual activists um, in concentric circles around the state. And she calls these groups the public spheres the politically oriented arenas of civil society. And outside those politically oriented arenas, but within the sphere of civil society come everyday citizens, also in a circle around the state. This is taking off from my article on everyday talk, putting everyday citizens in there, but in a circle around the state. Now that circular description makes sense when we are judging the deliberative contribution of these politically oriented areas and the rest of civil society to the legitimacy of state law. Here's a more recent, this was just last spring, Michael Neblo advanced another diagram, it's so small you won't be able to see it very well, in which the state exerts communication downward and civil society exerts communication upward with the upward flow, uh, here's a closer look up, the upward running from Bob Gooden's deliberation within, that's inside my brain, through uh, private discussion, informal networks, civic organizations, and interest groups. And Hendricks and Neblo and others who depict the deliberative system schematically include in, the in this private discussions what I've called in everyday talk. Whenever that talk is related to the binding decisions of the state, they describe that kind of talk as informal political talk, talk about politics, talk about public issues, or in Neblo's words, private talk that is recognizably political. The concept is state-centric, and it's useful for understanding the legitimate, legitimacy of state laws. But I would prefer a more messy um, approach. <laughs> And uh, 
I don't think those concentric circles, and this, this is only, you know, the, the thousandth of it, the hundred millionth of it, you could fill this space. Um, these concentric circles don't conf convey the deliberative complexity of the deliberative system, even when it comes to state laws. So just for the moment, stay with state laws, and I've, I've outlined a, a, a several layers of the state and some of its agencies and so forth in, in red. Um, thinking of this map now only at influencing state decisions. And that would include, of course, multinational corporations and international bodies and other levels and branches of the state, uh, including the military, epistemic communities, private foundations, churches, universities, social movements, unions, media, as well as everyday talk. Now, in this, the state not only has a monopoly of the legitimate use of force, it also has a unique role to play in constituting these deliberative systems. Liberal constitutional states create spaces of deliberation within political institutions such as legislatures and courts. They enable deliberation throughout the system by protecting free speech and association. They encourage deliberation by underwriting <coughs> institutions in which deliberation is itself con constitutive, such as universities and scientific research establishments. The state, in short, has its fingers everywhere in this deliberative system. But although states play a central and often constitutive role in deliberative systems, not all efficacious and important parts in the system lead to the state. The state is not the terminus of all deliberation. There are decisions in the society as well. It's society's locus of important decisions on practical matters of common concern. And these decisions can be formal, uh, perhaps taken in an organization within civil society, but they can also be informal and emergent. And I will spend a couple of minutes today talking about what I mean by an emergent decision. In such society-wide processes, almost all the nodes of deliberation can be interconnected. I hope this will make you laugh. <laughs> Took me a quite a while with a pencil to draw some of those in the, um, is, is this a system? Um, America's most hip cartoonist, Art Crumb, now living in the south of France, made this question famous, is this a system? He actually took the question from a cartoonist in the mid-1920s. This is not a very systematic system. But it does have the qualities of differentiation and interdependence that uh, we uh, stipulated earlier, and it is bounded by an arena of common concern, and we stipulate by the issue being uh, susceptible to common action. The question is whether individuals who have practical issues of concern to most or all of them have a deliberative system capable of processing these issues relatively well, either with the end of creating binding and implementable state law or with the end of deciding that this is not an issue that the state ought to deal with. These are issues that are decided among society, and sometimes these decision, the social decision is not to take it to the state. The demarcation of issues of common concern arises particularly when we include everyday talk, my concept of everyday talk, in the deliberative system, because not all talk counts. David Esland produced this example. The question whether jazz is a legitimate art form raises issues such as issues of race, jazz being associated with black culture originally, issues that are society-wide. So is jazz a legitimate art form might seem to be the question of a small subgroup, but it becomes through its implications with these larger issues, an issue of common concern. Who, she, who should be chosen in this year's uh, beauty contest is not a matter of common concern. This is uh, David, David's contrary example. Except if that beauty contest imp somehow implicates matters of more common concern, if it models, for example, unhealthy standards of beauty, or if it underwrites ethnic or racial stereotypes, then that issue might become an issue of common concern. <laughs> Jerry Mackey uh, gave us another example. A woman calling her husband a male chauvinist 
during a so society-wide social movement for gender justice falls in the area of common concern. The same woman chastising her husband for always leaving grounds in the coffee maker does not fall as a matter of common concern. So now we can argue over the boundaries in any particular case, but those, uh, and, and uh, we also want these to be of practical orientation, not merely speculative. Now I want to look at a couple of examples just to make things a bit clearer, to flesh out the way different forms can interact in the deliberative system. So let's look at the Tea Party in the United States. Its rhetoric and its practice are deeply lacking in respect for others. It's a steady source of misinformation. On the other hand, it does bring new individuals and groups into the democratic process and perhaps uh, sharpens, brings new facts and insights into the system. Or take the role of experts with their frequent, although not inevitable, epistemic gains, but their inclusion and equality deficits. Now we cannot simply weigh up the democratic deliberative costs and benefits of these entities without knowing more about the larger system in which they fit. Can the larger system absorb the gains and make up in other ways for the deficits? Sifting through the misinformation, for example. If it can, then we have essentially a net plus in the Tea Party because the larger system will deal with the deficits and we are left, so to speak, with the gains. But if the Tea Party, for example, in, in conjunction with parts of the media, has found ways to block the operation of standard epistemic filters in the system so that the deficits it introduces undermine the capacities of the system as a whole, then we should be more worried. So rather than looking just at the deficits and pluses and minuses of the Tea Party, we must fit it in to the system. And similarly with, let's say, comatology. You, you can see the benefits and the gains where it's small, but you can't understand them appropriately and normatively unless you look back at the, in, at the system and say, does the system have the capacity to make up for the deficits or to filter the deficits in some way? <laughs> Let's take a question of displacement. Think of the role of these new mini-publics that are now proliferating in Europe, the Commonwealth, and to some degree, the US. Uh, these are forms of what Mark Warren calls supplemental democracy. These little deliberative forms are based on relatively random samples of a relevant population brought together for a weekend, sometimes a little bit longer, with moderators, with balanced materials, and they usually genera generate a quite high quality of deliberation within this small forum and they have the potential for affecting the larger deliberative system favorably because uh, the citizenry can use them as in Marx's words uh, proxies, trust proxies. Citizens can trust them and, and think if this group deliberates in such a way and comes out with this conclusion, I in their place would come out with the same conclusion. I ought to at least take this conclusion seriously. So these little mini publics can um, really have a great positive effect on the lar larger deliberative system. But as John Parkinson showed in the British Health Service's use of citizen juries, which is one of these mini publics, and Mark Warren and Hillary Pierce showed with the British Columbia Citizens Assembly, the introduction of these mini, mini publics also disrupted the existing equilibrium in the deliberative system. So that in both cases, the mini publics challenged the claims to representativeness and thus undermine the status of the parties, social movement groups, other interest groups and NGOs, and politically active individuals. So that to the degree that we are concerned with mobilizing the citizenry, which a random sample does not do, we might take this intervention into the deliberative system rather negatively. Uh, for example, the Communist Party in China is extremely interested in these random mini-publics. They realize that they can displace public hearings. Public hearings pl pr 
provide a place for political organizing that a random sample does not. So that the party can get a, le a legitimate citizen voice through the mini publics, but it displaces the public hearings. So we have to think about not just the, what's going on in the mini forum and not just on its sort of, its emanations into the larger deliberative system, but also some of the displacements. Now I want to switch, those are two word, ones in which the mini or the deliberative system affects the state. I want to take a couple of very quick examples uh, from deliberation and society relatively separate from the state. Um, and the first is uh, very briefly Jerry Mackey's pacts against genital cutting. He's done some spectacular work uh, in Senegal studying the voluntary pacts in which villagers within an area get together after a year or more of discussions informally and everyday talk and within NGOs in the village um, and promise publicly in a ceremony both not to cut their female children and not to let their sons marry a cut woman. So he shows that only with such, or not only, but, but it helps very much to have such a public act with a high percentage of subscribers to produce a rapid change that moves from a bad equilibrium to a, to a better equilibrium. These pacts took place autonomously from the state. In fact, the privacy of genital cutting, uh, the way it works, almost requires voluntary, not state-enforced adherence. Yet the social decisions took place in and were greatly encouraged by a complex discursive network of foundations, voluntary associations, and politically active individuals. Um, I want to uh, now quickly go to another example from my own work um, to a phenomenon that I call enclave variation and everyday selection. As you can see, it takes off from a uh, evolutionary metaphor. And in this deliberative division of labor, two wrongs make a right. There are wrong, wrongs in the enclave, wrongs in everyday talk, but together they produce something better. Um, so social movement enclaves, which consist of activists in highly intense interaction, somewhat protected from he hegemonic ideas, create a hothouse of epistemic innovation and var variation. So the women's movement of the 60s and 70s, in which I took some part, uh, out of that came concepts of patriarchy, male chauvinism, sexism, sexual harassment, test tube babies, lesbian nation. <laughs> From the enclave came an explosion of new ideas and concepts. These enclaves were not inclusive. They were exclusive. It was, they suspected anyone from the mainstream nor did they respect opposing views. They dissed opposing views. Um, but from the variety of ideas that they generated, um, these women talking together in circum, then everyday women in ordinary life who were also talking together in circumstances very far from ideal deliberation, chose a few of these ideas that would advance gender justice in the, the women's own lives. So the concepts of sexist and sexism and male chauvinism, chauvinist, male chauvinism were more or less invented around the same time, around 1968. And in a measure of usage in the New York Times, you can see that they both rose in tandem, but then male chauvinism having many qualities of what linguists call a vogue word, declined. It lost its novelty, whereas sexism stayed in the language. But male chauvinism penetrated more broadly. In a survey that I fielded, which I think is the first survey ever to measure discourse, everyday discourse, 63% uh, of the English-speaking women in the Chicago area said that they had called someone a male chauvinist, either speaking directly to that person or talking about them to someone else. And that was almost twice the percentage that had used the word sexist. And that usage of male chauvinists cut across class and race and ideological lines so that more than 50% of women with only a high school education had used the phrase male chauvinist. And more than 50% of African American women, more than half of the women who were not registered to vote, more than half of the women who did not describe themselves as feminist, more than half of the women who called themselves conservative had said they had used the phrase. Now why male chauvinist and not sexist? 
It's very vogue word quality, let it be said, in jest. The joking usage protected the relatively vulnerable speaker. So for example, a Republican secretary in the South, whom I interviewed, reported talking about a, with a man she knew, and she said, I just would chucklingly tell him he was a male chauvinist pig. So chucklingly can be used teasingly with a little female gesture to say, oh, you male chauvinist. <laughs> <laughs> That protects the speaker. And the activists in their protected enclaves did not need it. Ordinary women in their everyday lives did need that protection. So they picked something that they could use from this, these enclaves and ran with it. In so doing, they used a phrase that helped com contribute to what I call an emergent decision. And I take the concept of emergence from um, a, a set of uh, the something called complex adaptive systems theory, which comes out of Santa Fe and, and has, been, has, has made a lot of progress in the last 15 years. There are books and books and books about it. Um, and the emergent theorists define emergence in this way, that many individual agents at a lower level, engage in intricate, reciprocally causal interactions with feedback effects that over time create a recognizable pattern or collectivity at a higher level, like a school of fish, or a hurricane, or a stock market among humans. An emergent phenomenon is not consciously coordinated. It's formed from microscopic mutual adjustments based on positive and negative feedback from actors in proximity to one another. Its outcome is more than the sum of its parts. Let's see. It's, sorry. It's a, um, a causal phenomenon in its own right. And at the same time that the parts cause the overall behavior, simultaneously the overall behavior guides the actions of the parts. That's one way that a society can make, quote, decisions. The word decision comes from the Latin root, sedera, to cut. You don't see a cut point in a social, social decision. You don't see a cut point in an emergent phenomenon. You don't see a point in which before that time you could say hurricane, not, no hurricane, and after that point you can say hurricane. It's an emergence, and we have to look back at it uh, to, to see. Um, I'm going to just very briefly, since I'm coming to the end of my time, talk about a couple of pathologies in the deliberative systems, drawing from Arkan Fung, one of the co-authors of the paper, um, and look at these uh, four uh, pathologies, tight coupling, decoupling, institutional domination, social domination. One virtue of a deliberative system is that failures in one institution can be compensated in another part. But when the parts of a deliberative system are too tightly coupled, to one another, that self-corrective quality is lost. So we can think of tight coupling as the problem of groupthink writ large on an institutional scale. Deliberative system failure from this pathology uh, could take place at the nation state level, for example, when nationalism or xenophobia sweeps a nation and those sentiments begin to drive individuals at every location in the deliberative system. Now, that process differs from c slow convergence on an epistemically or ethically superior alternative because it doesn't result from an epistemically lively contest of alternatives, mutual respect, or inclusion or equal opportunity in the deliberation. The decision of the US government in World War II to intern Japanese Americans met none of those criteria. But the force of the better argument did not prevail at that time because the argument could find no institutional point of purchase in the deliberative system, um, even in the universities. The parts of the deliberative system uh, which work well when they have interdependence, independence from one another, were all thinking the same way at that point. So that's one, too tight would be one pathology and a second pathology would be decoupling so that in this, in this pathology, the parts of the system which are supposed to act independently cannot act interdependently. They are decoupled 
in the sense that good reasons arising from one part fail to penetrate the others. So some parts may be particularly resistant to arguments from other parts. They may be uh, structurally isolated, um, or they may be, so, some groups may be so divided by uh, ideology or ethnicity or religion that they will, from others, that they won't listen to positions emanating from the other side. Third, a deliberative system fails when one of its parts, uh, whether deliberative or not, dominates all the others. So institutional domination obviously appears most starkly in an authoritarian society where one state or party or leader controls all the locations in the deliberative system. Um, but even democratic, in democratic systems, institutional domination can arise as uh, when Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi uh, had corporate control of major mass media outlets. And then a final pathology, which you all know, uh, of social domination arises when a particular social interest or social class uh, controls or exerts due undue influence over many, many parts of the deliberative system. So from the perspective of the system, its situation is particularly problematic if, for example, the use of wealth shifts the balance of reasons for laws and policies at many sites in the deliberative system. So support for political campaigns, private ownership of the media, concentrated media, financial backing that shifts the ecology of the secondary associations and NGOs, even financing for university-based research. When you see one uh, set of interests sif seeping into all the uh, different parts of the system, you have a, a pathology of social domination. So to conclude, um, from the beginning of the deliberative turn, deliberative theory has had the ambition to provide a normal, normative and empirical account of the democratic process as a whole. And the development of this account has proceeded incrementally. Much of the work in the first phase focused on developing the ideal of deliberation, the meaning, its meaning, justification, responses to theoretical criticisms. And particularly important at this point was the idea stage of laying out the idea of legitimacy at the core of deliberative democracy. Many theorists formulated the deliberative ideal on the foundational requirement that legitimate decisions be those that everyone could accept or at least not reasonably reject. And this phase emphasized what might be called ideal proceduralism, that's Jim Bowman's term, ideal proceduralism as a regulative ideal. Now, ideal proceduralism encouraged thinking of the standards for deliberative legitimacy through the lens of an ideal deliberative forum. So when the second phase saw the proliferation of empirical studies and practical applications of the theory, many deliberative Democrats began with the image of an individual forum as they tried to think about the ideal in concrete terms and seek approximations in the real world. Activists, theorists, and governmental officials collaborated on introducing new varieties of deliberative forums, including citizens' juries, uh, consensus councils, citizens' assemblies, <coughs> other representative mini-publics designed to make possible deliberation within some approximation of a microcosm of the citizenry. Ultimately, however, none of these deliberative processes can be studied adequately in isolation, apart from their broader systemic content, context, sorry, Deliber deliberative democracy is more than a sum of deliberative moments. And so at this moment in the deliberative turn, deliberative theory must be concerned with the democratic process as a whole, and therefore with the systemic relationship of the parts to the whole. Thank you. Thank you.